Good morning, church family and friends. Welcome to our worship service this morning. I am so glad that you've joined us. I hope you had a good week. And if you didn't, I'm glad you're here because today we are going before the throne of heaven. And I promise you, we will find peace and rest in the love and presence of our Lord Jesus Christ. So please join us as we sing together, as we look up to heaven and lift up the Son of God, Jesus our Savior.
Bow our heads for prayer. 
Our most gracious, kind, only Father, Lord, we thank you, Lord, for being our God. We thank you, Lord, that despite all these things that are happening, um, that we can come to you because you are an unchanging God. You are our foundation, you are our strength, and you are our hope. And so, Lord, that's why we come to you, because there is no other God out there. You're the only one that truly is the reason for our hope and our future. Lord, we thank you, Lord, that through all of this, you have not stopped guiding us. That you have promised that you'll never leave us or forsake us. And during these times, Lord, where it may feel bleak, we can have the promise, Lord, that your love, Lord, is great. It's deeper than the deepest sea. It's higher than the highest mountains. And so, Lord, we come to you in all our humbleness, Lord, with just humbleness, and we come to you with just as we are, Lord. And we ask that you would forgive our sins. Lord, for the many times, Lord, that we have depended on ourselves, trusted in ourselves, Lord. We come to you, Lord, and we ask for your forgiveness. Lord, we take hope and courage and strength, Lord, in the promise that you have said that though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow, though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. And so, Lord, we come to you just as we are, Lord, in humility, because we know that we need you. And so we ask for your help, Lord. Lord, I'd like to lift up our church as we go into this next phase of reopening, Lord. I ask that you would give us your wisdom through your Holy Spirit that we may open in the right way, the right time. Lord, that we may be a church of action during this time, Lord, of um, just of uh, social distancing, this uh, unnormalness of uh, society right now because of the COVID virus. Lord, I know that you're wanting to prepare us for a greater work once society opens. And so, Lord, I pray for our church, that our church, Lord, would emerge from this one that is ready to go out, Lord, to share your love to our community, to share that your second coming is near and that you want everyone to be ready. Lord, I pray, Lord, for our church members, Lord. I pray for those who are sick, those who are lonely. I pray for those who may be having a lot of anxieties, Lord, uh, due to certain things, uh, whether it be uh, the whole isolation thing or just the uncertainty of future. Lord, I pray for your peace that passes all understanding to be upon them, Lord. especially today on this Sabbath. Lord, I pray, Lord, that you would be near to them that they would feel your presence because Lord, when your presence is there, there is always peace. Lord, I pray this morning, Lord, for, um, for Victor, Lord, as he preaches the sermon. Lord, I pray that you would anoint him with your Holy Spirit. I pray, Lord, that um, we would not hear him, but we would hear you speaking through him. And most of all, Lord, that our hearts would be ready to receive your word and that we would not just hear your word, Lord, but that we would also do it. And so guide us, Lord. Guide us as a church. Lord, I can't wait till the day where we come back together um, to worship together. And so, Lord, may that day be soon, but may it not be just like the regular, normal church, Lord, but may it be, Lord, a church service of just just wanting and realizing the times that we are in the times 
this time that is just so close to your second coming that all we want to do is work for you, Lord. So thank you, Lord, for all that you've done for us. Um, thank you, Lord, for just your blessings, your grace, your goodness. Thank you, Lord, that we can call upon you in prayer. We love you. Be with us today. Be with us this week, the next month. Just be with us continually, Lord. We thank you and we love you. In your name I pray. Amen. Today's message is titled, Lepers, Holiness, and the Worldview-Shattering Touch of Jesus. Church family, I invite you to turn with me to Matthew chapter 8. We will begin reading in verse 1. Now, before we read, let me tell you that the writer of Matthew is structuring his book very carefully. And for the last three chapters, Jesus has been up on this hillside and he's been preaching and uncovering and expanding on his announcement that the kingdom of God is here. It's in him. And for the last three chapters in Matthew, in what is known as the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus has been exploring and explaining what it means to be his disciple, what it means to enter into the life of God's kingdom. But now in chapter 8, the writer of Matthew transitions into a new section of the book. Now Jesus comes down from the hillside and he enters the day-to-day -day life in these small towns and villages all around the Sea of Galilee. And now Jesus begins to reveal and introduce the kingdom of God, not just in his words, but also in his actions. And the first story that Matthew tells us at this transition is the story of a man with leprosy, with a skin disease, who approaches Jesus and walks away from that encounter completely transformed. So let's read together. Turn with me to Matthew 8, verse 1. When Jesus came down from the mountainside, large crowds followed him. A man with leprosy came and knelt before him and said, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Jesus reached out his hand and touched the man. I am willing, he said, be clean. Immediately, he was cleansed of his leprosy. And then Jesus said to him, See that you don't tell anyone, but go show yourself to the priest and offer the gift Moses commanded as a testimony to them. So, in verse 2, we read that the man with leprosy kneels before Jesus and says, Lord, if you're willing, make me clean. Now, notice that what the man is not saying is this, Jesus, if you are able, will you make me clean? He is not asking whether Jesus is capable of dealing with his sickness. He says, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Somehow this man is convinced that Jesus can heal him. But what he's not certain about is whether or not Jesus would be willing to do something like that for him. What he's not certain about is Jesus's character. He knows Jesus is powerful and capable, but he doesn't know if Jesus is good or compassionate. And so he asks Jesus, are you willing? Would you help someone like me? And Matthew tells us that Jesus reaches out to him and touches him, which is an incredibly significant detail because this guy has leprosy. This is a skin problem, which has all sorts of implications in that time, in that culture. It means that this man has probably not been touched or embraced by another person for a long time. And so Matthew depicts this beautiful, humane compassion of Jesus who, who reaches out and touches this man that no one else has touched. And Jesus says, I am willing, be clean. And immediately this man is cleansed of his leprosy. And if you don't know anything else about Jesus or anything else about the Old Testament or about Jewish culture, and if this is the first story you hear about Jesus, you would very easily conclude that Jesus is a great guy. 
He is compassionate. He is concerned about the well-being of others. He is a great person. And we can stop right here. We can close our Bibles and we can walk away and we will be impressed with how great Jesus is. Now, of course, we're not going to do that today. Because even though a simple reading of this story will show you how great Jesus is, Jesus is much more amazing than, than a simple reading of this story would show you. And we know that because these stories about Jesus in the Gospels are like onions. They have layers on top of layers that you can peel back and find so much more to them. So let's do that for the next few minutes. And let's begin with this question. Why did the writer of Matthew choose this story as the first story to put in front of us right after the Sermon on the Mount. And I think the reason why is that for a Jewish person, for someone who, who does know the storyline of the Hebrew Scriptures, this story is, is category-breaking. It's worldview-shattering. It shatters everything you thought you knew about the Bible and about God. And it's all wrapped up in one word. One word that is at the center of the story. We read it in verse 2 when the man asks Jesus, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. That's the word, clean. Why does this man say that? Is he, just, is, is he like dirty? Like he, does he have dirt all over him? Maybe, but not necessarily. You can have leprosy, you can have a skin disease, but be, you know, good, have good hygiene. Then why does this man ask to be made clean? Why does he use that word? And Jesus later affirms it. He says, be clean, be cleansed. So what is this about? There are other perfectly good words that, that he could have used in Greek or in Hebrew to, to say healing or being healed. And yet, that is not what this man asks for. He's asking to be made clean. And that little word opens up a whole new level of power and significance to this story. Which is why I think Matthew puts it first, right after the Sermon on the Mount. And to really grasp that, we need to do a bit of work here. So for the next few minutes, I'm going to lead you through a fast tour of the history of Israel. And I'm gonna throw a lot at you and kind of fast, but I think you can track with me. So let's begin at the beginning. You ready? Here we go. So in the beginning, God created everything to be perfect. But then humans mess it up. We create hell on earth. But then out of all of the peoples and nations in the world, God chooses one family called the family of Abraham, also known as the people of Israel. And God is going to restore blessing and goodness to all of humanity through this family. But they end up in slavery in Egypt until Moses shows up and rescues them out of slavery in Egypt. And so they go through the wilderness and they get to the foot of a mountain and God enters into a covenant relationship with this family. And he wants them to become his people. And he wants to restore that Garden of Eden presence and relationship that we were all created for, but that we lost. And so what God does is that he finds a way to place his personal presence right in the midst of the family of Israel. And that takes the form of a box called the Ark of the Covenant, which is placed, it sits in this sacred tent called the tabernacle. And the tabernacle and the Ark of the Covenant, they are built to house the presence of God right in the center of the, the people of Israel. And the whole point of this is that God's unique and holy presence is in the midst of Israel. And so let's, let's pause here. Let's read one of the many passages in the Old Testament where God describes the significance and the implications of placing his very presence in the tabernacle right there in the midst of the people of Israel. 
So turn with me in your Bibles to Leviticus chapter 11, and we're going to read verses 44 and 45. God says, I am the Lord your God. Consecrate yourselves and be holy because I am holy. Do not make yourselves unclean by any creature that moves along the ground. I am the Lord who brought you out of Egypt to be your God. Therefore, be holy because I am holy. So in these two verses, the word that repeats the most is the word holy. And that's not by accident. Because the idea of holiness is very much central to the tabernacle, the place that houses the presence of God among his people. And the point in these verses is that God is holy, and because he has planted himself there in the midst of the people of Israel, they also have to become holy. So then the next question has to be, what is holiness? And here's where things get interesting. Because in our modern culture, we think of holiness mostly in terms of morality. Being holy means being a good moral person. And that's the idea behind expressions like holier than thou. And there's truth to that. Morality is a part of holiness in the Bible, and we'll see that later. But it's just one part, and it's maybe not even the main part. You see, the Hebrew word for holiness is the word kadosh. And in the passage that we just read, kadosh is placed in direct contrast to being unclean. Now, the basic meaning of kadosh is to be unique, to be one of a kind, to be distinct, to be set apart for a specific purpose. Here's one of the best analogies that I have come across to help us understand the idea behind kadosh. Now, in the Bible, God is holy in the same way that in a hospital, an operating room is holy. Now, most of us have been inside a hospital, but few of us have been inside an operating room in a hospital. And those of us who have been in an operating room, we've been in there only under very specific circumstances and only for a specific amount of time and only for a specific reason. And that's because the operating room in a hospital is holy. It's set apart. It's unique. It's set apart for operations and surgeries. It's set apart for helping people that have some kind of complex, maybe life-threatening condition. They have a sickness that requires surgery or an operation. And so the purpose of that room is about saving life. It's about improving people's qualities of life. That's the only reason that room exists. And the only reason you're ever supposed to go and be in that room is for that purpose. But there's more, because only a handful of special people can go into that room. There's the patient, of course, but there's also some other people. There's uh, uh, the nurses and the doctors and the surgeons, and they are unique and they are set apart. These people have to go through a long process to become set apart, to become holy before they can go into that holy operating room. There is years of schooling. Then they have to take off their clothes and put on special clothes and wash their hands and put on masks. They have to go through this intricate rituals that, that highlight, that, that point the, to the fact that, that this operating room is a unique holy space that is dedicated to saving lives, to improving the quality of people's lives. Then there's all kinds of things outside of the operating room that should never be allowed in because they would threaten to contaminate this holy space. What if, what if you step on some dog waste? You can't wear the shoes in there. What if you have a, a runny nose? You can't go in there like that. And all of this makes sense to us. We're familiar with it. Well, in the Bible, 
and particularly around the tabernacle and the temple, God's holiness is depicted much like that. God is holy because God is unique and He's one of a kind as the author and the creator of all life and all that is good and beautiful and just. And so when God takes up residence among these people, they too have to become like that. They're called to reflect that in their own lives. And so God tells Moses and tells the people of Israel, what are the things that will make you holy? What are the things that would do the opposite? What are the things that will make you unclean? What are the things that will contaminate or, or defile the holy space? And here's an example of that. And just a heads up, things get interesting here, maybe a bit uncomfortable, but I know you can keep an open mind and go through this with me. Turn to Numbers chapter 5. We'll read the first three verses. Numbers 5, beginning in verse 1. We read, The Lord said to Moses, Command the Israelites to send away from the camp anyone who has a defiling skin disease or discharge of any kind or who is ceremonially unclean because of a dead body. Send away, male and female alike, send them outside the camp so they will not defile their camp where I dwell among them. So three things. Three things will make you unclean. A defiling skin disease, a discharge of any kind, and yes, without going into detail, this includes what happens during sex, and being in contact with a dead body. Now, skin disease and being in contact with a dead body, those are probably easier to kind of wrap our minds around. Like you, you wouldn't want somebody with an infectious illness who just buried their family dog and didn't wash their hands to walk into the operating room and then start touching everything. Well, in the same way, with these two things, you are marked by disease and death in some way. So you shouldn't walk into the holy space where the author of life dwells. But then there's this third thing, the discharge of any kind. And this one's a bit more tricky to understand and definitely more uncomfortable to talk about. But it's actually very profound because it refers to the unique fluids in your body that are sacred and holy because those fluids have a unique purpose that is associated with creating new life. And life is sacred. And those fluids are sacred and holy. But when those fluids come out of your body in some other way that is not connected to the purpose of creating new life, then that makes you unclean. It's like, it's like you're leaking life fluid. And I know that's not how we think about it today, but that's how they thought about it. And it's actually very profound. And so underneath all of this, there's the, the belief that when you come into contact with any of these three things, you have come into contact with something that is a symbol of your mortality and death. And that represents a, a threat to the holiness of God's presence that dwells in the tabernacle. The tabernacle with all these rules, it, it, it's a whole cultural symbol system that was meant to say that God is the author of all life and that he has taken up residence here in the midst of Israel and that they, the Israelites, are called to honor and to recognize the holiness and the goodness of his presence by keeping away anything that would contaminate or defile it. So now fast forward about 500 years from Moses and we find a story that picks up this whole idea and takes it in a whole new direction. It's a story about the prophet Isaiah. Now Isaiah lived in Jerusalem by the temple where God's holy presence dwells. And one day 
Isaiah has a vision where he finds himself in the temple, in the very presence of the holy God of Israel. And in, and in this story, uh, this is what he experiences. Let's read together uh, Isaiah chapter 6, beginning in verse 1. We read that in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord high and exalted, seated on a throne, and the, and the, and the train of his robe filled the temple. So all of a sudden, Isaiah is in the temple, and in real life, they would have, this would have never happened. He would have never been allowed to be in the temple in real life. So he finds himself in this vision in the temple, in the presence of God, and he says, Above him were seraphim, each with six wings. With two wings they cover their face, with two they cover their feet, and with two they were flying. Now, I want you to get the right image in your mind, because it's actually pretty intimidating, maybe even scary. These creatures, these seraphim, are not human-like creatures. They're actually more like animals. In fact, the word seraph means snake. And so these animal-like creatures are actually uh, representatives uh, of every part of creation. And they are praising God, the Creator. We read in verse 3, They were calling to one another, Holy, 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 kadosh, 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 is the Lord Almighty, the whole earth is full of His glory. And at the sound of their voices, the doorpost and thresholds shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. Now look at Isaiah's response. Woe to me, I cried. I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. Isaiah is terrified. And he's terrified because he is in the presence of God while being a man of unclean lips. And this is profound because Isaiah is using the idea of uncleanness as something that goes much deeper than just his body. Because in this vision, Isaiah is not literally unclean, not in terms of having touched a dead body or having a skin disease or the other one. He is unclean in the sense of moral corruption. He is indicating that his uncleanness is much more deeper than just his body. It's his mind, it's his heart, it's his words, his thoughts. He is a man of unclean lips and he lives among a people of unclean lips, meaning he lives in a culture that speaks selfishness and injustice and idolatry and death. And now he's in the presence of the very author of all beauty and all goodness and all life. And he is terrified because this is not supposed to happen. You're not supposed to go, you're supposed to go through all these rituals to be able to even go into the temple. And then this happens. Verse 6. Then one of the seraphim flew to me with a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with tongs from the altar. With it, he touched my mouth and said, See, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for, your sin covered for. So, the, the burning coal touches Isaiah's lips. But instead of incinerating him, it cleanses him. It purifies him. It, it burns him pure. Now, at the beginning of this vision, of this scene, Isaiah thinks that he is defiling God's holy presence. He is operating within a mindset said by the book of Leviticus that says that death and uncleanness is contagious and will contaminate the holy space. But what he's experiencing now in this vision is actually the opposite. 
Because what's happening is that God's holiness that is represented here by this burning coal is not defiled when it touches Isaiah's lips. Instead, it's actually God's holiness that becomes contagious. And God's holiness and purity and power purges him and transforms him completely and burns away the sin. And for someone like Isaiah, this is shattering all ideas of who God is. Because it's showing that God's purpose was, was never that Israel's isolation from, from God would be permanent. The whole temple imagery was meant to communicate the, the profound truth that you and I, we are broken, we are, we are messed up, and we are marked by sin and death. And in contrast to us, God is, is perfect and pure, and He is holy, and He's the author of all life. But you see, the story doesn't end there in Leviticus. The story is moving towards God's holiness actually becoming contagious and infecting the world with a power to cleanse and to transform it. That's where the story of Israel is going. And we fast forward 700 years from Isaiah and we find Jesus coming down from this, this hillside into the, the hustle of daily life in this fishing village in Galilee. The kingdom of God is coming down this hillside to invade normal people's lives. And the first story that Matthew puts in front of us to show us what that looks like is a story about a man with a skin disease who wants to know if Jesus is willing to make him clean. He's been barred from the temple. He can't go to Jerusalem. He is cut out from the worshiping community. He's considered unclean. And here is Jesus, the very embodiment of God's holy presence. And he extends his hand and touches him. Now, according to Leviticus, what is supposed to happen in that moment is that that man's impurity would make Jesus unclean. But that doesn't happen because Leviticus is not the end of the story. What actually happens is that Isaiah's vision becomes reality because it's Jesus' holiness that is contagious. And it transfers to this man and it eradicates his uncleanness and makes him holy and pure. This is so powerful. This is, this is gospel. This is good news. Our uncleanness and our sin and our corruption are not threatening to Jesus. Not at all. He comes with this power and this authority and embodying the actual presence of God, moving towards people whose bodies are riddled with, with, with death. And, and he, he's moving towards people whose, whose cultures are riddled with, with unclean lips, with sin and selfishness and death. And Jesus is not intimidated. He moves right towards it. And he extends his hand and says, not only am I able, but I am willing. Be clean. And then look at what Jesus tells this man in verse 4. Jesus said to him, see that you don't tell anyone. I'm trying to keep a low profile here by myself a little bit more time. But go show yourself to the priest and offer the gift Moses commanded as a testimony to them. Because in the priest's worldview, God's holiness is limited to the temple. And so the temple must be protected from being defiled. But Jesus comes and with the touch of his hand, he shatters that worldview. And he introduces a whole new story where God's holiness is not limited to the temple anymore. Jesus is embodying contagious the, the contagiousness of God's holiness that is coming out into the world and, and purifying and cleansing and forgiving 
unclean, sinful, messed up people. And that's good news. Now, how does this story speak God's word to us today? I think, I think this is it. The, the reality is that most of us, we consider ourselves followers of Jesus. But, but more often than not, we, we mess up. We make mistakes. We fail. We act against our, our conscience. We act against the, the example, the teachings of Jesus. Now, I thought about listing examples here, but I, I, I'm not going to. Rather, I want to ask you to just think about them yourself. And I think all you have to do is just look back at your day yesterday Look at it honestly. I'm sure you'll find plenty there. We, we mess up. We, we fail. And, and for most of us, when we fail, what goes on in our minds are, are thoughts like, like this, like, like God is ashamed of me. And when we give way to that, we easily end up avoiding Jesus because, because we think that somehow he is threatened by our failure. We end up avoiding prayer. We avoid meeting Jesus in the scriptures. We avoid meeting other Christians. We sometimes even avoid coming to, to Sabbath worship because we think that we can't go near Jesus. And, and if that is you, what you need to understand today is that Jesus passionately disagrees with that point of view because that's not the story of the gospel that's a different story the story of the gospel tells that God is not threatened or intimidated by your sin so many of us grew up being being taught that a holy God will not tolerate sin in his presence but that is a half truth and if it remains a half-truth, it can become dangerous. It can distort your view of Jesus. Because the whole point of the gospel is that God can tolerate sin in his presence. That's the story of Isaiah. And not only does God tolerate it, he moves towards it with such passion and intensity that Isaiah is forced to own, to name it, to confess his brokenness. And instead of being destroyed, he is transformed by that encounter with God's holiness. And in Matthew, with, with this man with leprosy, we see in that encounter that Jesus is God's holiness on a mission. Your, your sin, my sin, is not threatening to Jesus. Now, that does not mean that you have license to do whatever the heck you want. Not at all. What it means is that Jesus will not leave you alone. That he's going after you. He's going to burn you clean. And that's good news. So if you are thinking that God wants nothing to do with you because of your failure, the good news with a story like this one is that you could not be more wrong about Jesus' character. We read in, in verse 2 that the man with leprosy asks Jesus, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. And this, this man doesn't doubt Jesus' ability. He doubts Jesus' character, whether Jesus would move forward towards an unclean person like him. And Jesus says, you couldn't be more wrong. And he touches this man. And this man walks away transformed. So this story is good news. It's gospel. Because it confirms that there is hope for people like you and like me. For a world like ours. So whatever your story of failure is. Whatever your leprosy is. Know that it's not threatening to Jesus. And as we sing this last song, 
you can sing with a bold confidence, knowing that Jesus has both the power and the desire to burn you clean through his holy presence. Church family, as you go into a new week, as you live through the ups and downs, the victories and the failures of your everyday life, through it all, I, I pray that you may be confident in the love of the Holy God of heaven, who is both capable and willing to make you clean day after day until the new day when we're finally home. Have a blessed and restful Sabbath, and we'll see you again next week.